What is up, Outpost Gray fan? Are you guys ready for this? I am stoked. You guys see the shirt that I'm wearing? Global Cyber Games. For anybody who participated in Global Cyber Games, you guys, throw your names in the chat. I already see that the chat is uh, blowing up. You guys were already chatting before we even kicked off. Carrie, nice to see you. Good to see you, James. I was surprised you weren't first. Uh, Cybersecurity Central, love you guys. Kimberly, Michelle, Jess, you guys are amazing. I'm really, really excited about the discussion today because we're going to be diving into another topic that I really enjoy talking about, which is all about cybersecurity communications, the effect of having a really good communication strategy and what that looks like within your org. But really quick, before we dive in too deep, for all the newbies, if you're watching this right now, welcome to Outpost Gray. It's a YouTube channel that I've designed your host, Jack Scott, to provide you information in cybersecurity, technology, and innovation. And if you can see above me, this YouTube channel is in partnership with Grant Thornton Public Sector. And all of the content that I deliver here is of my unique thoughts and opinions, and it is not the representation of Grant Thornton's thoughts and opinions. So welcome to all my repeat offenders and for everybody new. Also, if you are new and this is your first time attending and you're going to love, I'm telling you, you're going to love the live stream, make sure to like and subscribe. And just to let you know, every Thursday, we drop a new episode at this time, 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Typically, I will do one-on-one -on -one interviews like we're doing today with David Libby, or I will have a fireside chat or maybe a panel. So it's always getting changed up every time. So let's talk about our guest that's going to be coming on the show today. I'm really excited because we're going to be talking about public relations, communications, and we're going to be doing it with public relations and startup expert David Livy. He has a wealth of knowledge in this space and some things that we're going to talk about today will be about what is an effective communication strategy, what does that look like, and then also how can you leverage a communication strategy to maybe get ahead of an incident or maybe even mitigate it, which when I talked to David on our pre-show, I never even had thought about communication strategy as possibly a control measure for mitigating an incident. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get David on here. Welcome to the show, David. How are you? I'm great, Jack. How are you? I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm excited for you to be here. What okay, so I always I'm always curious when like the guests and their backgrounds, is that is that your real background? This is a real background. This is not virtual. Uh, this, this is actually a, a series of photographs that was taken by an artist of a woman walking through a part of Italy. Oh my God. Is this Northern, Southern Italy? I love Italy. It's one of my favorite places in Europe. I don't know. I, we asked the artist and she didn't yes. have specifics on where this was taken. I'm sure if, if uh, someone knows Italy really well, they'll probably be able to recognize this wall. We just fell in love with just this collection of images and how this it just takes us through this woman's experience of walking down the street. I love it. Yeah, Italy, and I, I already, I have some art pieces in my room from Italy. I had such a great time there, but this live stream isn't about Italy, although it should be. Uh, it's about okay. you and your experience, David. So before we like jump too deep into the topics at hand today, I want to give you a moment to share a little bit about your background and how you got into the public relations position and what you're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jax. I got into the public relations position actually in the entertainment industry. I was working in Hollywood representing celebrities at a very famous PR firm named Dale Olson and Associates. I started off in the mailroom and we work with Shirley MacLaine and James Earl Jones. We helped launch Halle Berry's career. And after that, I was actually recruited up to the San Francisco Bay Area to work for another well-renowned PR firm named Ehouse Ryan Wong, which launched the iMac. So they had this really close relationship with Steve Jobs and they had me work on the Pixar account with Steve Jobs and we launched A Bug's Life and then subsequently Toy Story 2. And then by helping change the narrative, Pixar got acquired by Disney. Oh, that is a wow! That is fascinating. Okay, right. so you and it, go ahead. 
Go ahead. I was going to say just entertainment, entertainment, but I I do have a transition into technology and and the security world, so I can touch on that too. <laughs> that's that's what I was going to ask. I was like, how did you go from <laughs> Pixar and doing Hollywood to cybersecurity? Wow. I was very fortunate to work for Niels Ryan Wong. They they they're defunct now, but they were a, and still are a very talented group of people that attracted some of the best and brightest vendors companies out there in the space, particularly in the B2B sector. And they were working with a lot of security companies back in the day, because I started with them in 1998. And one of the companies was uh, just John Atala was one of the clients they were working with. And you know, he his background, I think his father's background, they invented the ATM pin. You'll have to look that up. And so I, I just begged if I could do anything on the account and they were very kind and they, they brought me on in the background to help learn a little bit more about security, um, the security space, the players. And I fell in love with it. And after that, I, I just, I couldn't get enough of it. And so when I then left that company and moved on, I then was very fortunate again to work with cybersecurity leaders and adopt new clients in the cybersecurity space. And that was gosh, many years ago. Mm, that's amazing. Your story. Wow. What a robust background. So um, you so you were in PR for the majority of your career. This is the space that you kind of found yourself in, that, which is so fortunate because so many people, myself included, I feel like I've done so many things. So it sounds like you're you're one of those individuals that have a mile depth of knowledge within this space versus the individuals that have a mile long but an inch deep. Yours is a mile deep but maybe an inch wide, where you're really knowledgeable within the space and you've worked in a lot of different environments, but within communications. Yeah, 28 years in communications. I mean, not to date myself, but no, I got a little gray on my beard, <laughs> so you know that that kind of makes up. It shows that the folks kind of where I'm at. But yeah, across the spectrum, right? Like you were saying, I was very fortunate to start off in the entertainment sector and then gradually, through the help of Steve Jobs and, and Pixar, get into the technology sector and then get out of entertainment, be fully in technology and then work on so many things. I don't think everyone is good at everything mm -mm. Uh, necessarily. You know, I specifically like to focus on media relations. Some folks focuses on crisis communications and other aspects of public relations. There are many different kinds of public relations, right? Even the social media communications is a type of public relations, you know, managing the relationship between the public and the company in a public forum. Uh, but I, I am specific to really traditional public relations, helping our clients get press in online publications, on podcasts, on television. Well, that brings me a really good question because you're talking about like good press. You know, that's what everybody kind of thinks about. And But some people in the cybersecurity space are worried about that bad press being that next mm -hmm. high, uh, um, that next um, primary news that is labeled next big breach, solar winds, you know, colonial pipelines. I'd love for you to explain a little bit about what do you define as good versus bad press within cybersecurity and in working in this space? What's been your experience? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good question because it, it is so broad, right? The clients that we work with are the B2B clients. They're the vendors behind the scenes that are helping these companies not be as affected by breaches. They're going to get breached, right? Eventually everybody's going to get a breach. Uh, but, you know, so we've been on the back end of it, not on the front end of it. When I see the front end, I keep thinking, gosh, you know, how painful that must be for a PR person to all of a sudden go into crisis communications mode. But it isn't all of a sudden because they have an incident response strategy. At least I'm hoping they do. Every company should have a plan, like a social media guide, an incident response guide that essentially sets them up. Like if this happens, we are going to respond in this way. If this happens, we're going to respond in this way. And then if this happens, if that escalation is at this point, you know, we should sit down with the executives or with the board to discuss how are we going to approach this if we are going to approach this. And that I think that's been a real challenge for companies on the PR side because it, it depends. You know, when Target had their PR, PR, big PR breach, you know, as a consumer, what do you do? Do you say, I'm not going to go to Target anymore? Of course you're not. 
you're going to trust that Target's just going to update their systems because you're going to be fine. We're all still going to go to Target and love Target. But there still needs to be a communication strategy where Target says, you know, this happened, this is how we're handling it. But what I also like to see, Jax, is not a one-off communication strategy. I hope that a company like a Target or like any other corporation that gets hit with some sort of breach brings in the narrative of what they stand for and, and how they communicate to their customers, how they've been communicating to their customers in the communications field. So they're not all of a sudden standing up and saying, you know, now we're a superhero and now we're going to take care of this. I hope that all along they've been very communicative, and very clear mm-hmm. how important it is to protect their customers' privacy, their customers' rights, their customers' data, and that this is just, you know, something that could have happened, unfortunately did happen, but they're on top of it because as we promised you, we are always taking care of you. We're always yeah. looking out for you. Yeah, customers always first. I love that. Um, I have a quick question that popped in the chat. It's it's on public relations a little bit there, and then we're going to come back. I really like this question that Carrie's asking, and it's about basically leveraging public relations as a vector, as an avenue to be able to break into cybersecurity. Because you don't really think of, oh yeah, cybersecurity and there's public relations, but you're very connected into the cybersecurity space. Would you see this as a route for somebody to be able to use, to be able to break into the industry in a way? So using public relations to get to learn more about the industry? Um, his question, I think, is if he wanted to go into public relations, like, for example, GRC is a really great approach if you want to break into cybersecurity. Um, and you can start with GRC and then go into like red team or blue team. But what if somebody wanted to specifically do public relations for cybersecurity? Do you think that that could give them an easier approach than maybe going in as like a pen tester or a SOC analyst? They may have an easier time. Then once they get in, they have their foot in the door, then they can maybe move around and then get a job as a SOC analyst or a GRC or CTI? Yeah, I I haven't actually experienced someone doing that. Typically, the folks that I work with in the cybersecurity sector are deep within the weeds. Mm -hmm. And this is is one of those particular sectors that where you really have to know your stuff, right? You really, or you you really have to understand what your client is saying or, or the company you're working for is saying and be able to articulate it to a third party. And so, to jump into it and then to use it as as a, a sounding board. I mean, what I would do is if you really want to get into cybersecurity, start attending the, attending the cybersecurity conferences, you know, especially like the RSA conference, the Black Hat conference, you know, some of the top tier networking conferences. And, you know, you don't even have to necessarily go to every single event they throw, but, you know, hobnobbing, talking to people at the exhibit halls, going to some of the booths, even virtually, I think you could learn a lot and that'll help you get an edge and start, getting into the, like, how do people speak? What are they speaking about? What's trendy? Yeah. Getting your face, getting your name out there. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I think, uh, I think it would be hard to go in and try to use public sector or even marketing as a way to break into the industry. If you're trying to get on to the more technical or more specific uh, red team or blue team side. So that's great. Great insight on that. So what does a PR person do? Like, can you explain what does your day to day look like uh, working in the cybersecurity space in in public relations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I particularly think it's really fun because I love the chase. I love to really get the clients on board with, okay, this is how they're different, right? This is how they stand out from the competition. And now what tools do you have and how we can communicate that? Right. There's that differentiating and then there's the messaging that goes to the different audiences. And how are we communicating that messaging? Is it through a survey they're releasing? Is it through new hires they're, you know, announcing? Is it through, well, you know, this is trending in the media and I have experts that can speak to that. And so every day I sit down, I think about, okay, what are these clients objectives? What is this company's objectives and how can I map their position, their differentiation to that messaging to that objective that they have in their business. And, and it's simply, it's simply that at the 40,000 level. And then from then on, Jax, it is, well, okay. So we know this person at eWeek writes about this topic. And we know that the client has this, that aligns with that reporter at eWeek. So we're going to introduce that client to that reporter and hope there's a match and that they'll be in sync and that one will want to talk to the other. 
Yeah. That's a lot of gambling, a lot of what ifs. Have you ever been in a situation where uh, one individual didn't want to talk to another and you had a lot of friction? I mean, I can imagine you probably have in this space because it's all about interpersonal skills. Yeah, it's it's a, a lot of it's about interpersonal skills and a lot of it is about trust. Mm. You know, it's it's really remarkable that e no matter what you have on your website, you know, you, you, you have when you're sitting in front of a reporter, especially in person, they're looking at your body language. They're listening to your voice there. That, that's a huge part of it. They, they've done that. Hopefully they've done their research or your PR person, hopefully has done his or her research to prove to them. Well, you know, this is a person who works for a company that really has something that's been established. That's credible. That has customers that is proven. Mm -hmm. And and so then and then how that individual, how that spokesperson articulates that is huge. And we spend a lot of time media training our clients on how to really effectively communicate that differentiation very succinctly and very well so that they have that kind of you know instant trust uh, and they're able to you know have that connection. And then sometimes the CEOs come in you know, beating their chests and they're the greatest thing since sliced bread and they've got their Kool-Aid cup on the side and it makes it twice as hard for them because, you know, the journalists talk to a lot of these folks. They know the space as well as the people behind the wheel. And so they challenge them even more so in the analyst relations space where the analysts have even more of a higher touch point because they're really delving into the weeds, creating all these really detailed reports. And so, you know, you get a lot of pushback, a lot of, um, you know, friction between the two parties. And so part of it is, is helping these spokespeople manage that before and during and after the relationship with the journalist or with the analyst. Although I'm a little bit atypical in that I don't jump into the interview process while it's happening. because so I personally think that's obnoxious. I think that if the you know, executive is really trained well and they've had a lot of practice, they are who they are. You have to let them be who they are and, and then in that case, you know, kind of like you said, there's a lot of what ifs, but, you know, life is a game, you know, and hopefully it's a game you're playing well. Yeah. And that that really actually leads me to something we talked about during the pre-show, because you were talking about um, working with the executives in the space and the different personalities that you're going to be engaging in. And cybersecurity as a whole is just a different animal. You've got different personalities. You've got a lot of really smart people, a lot of people that think they're smart, but their ego really is doing a lot of the talking. And you have to have interpersonal, interpersonal skills, but even more so have a high emotional EQ in this space, I feel, yeah. to be able to really navigate and be successful. And I'm curious for you, what, what challenges have you faced being in the cybersecurity space, working with these executives, with these big like egos and intelligent people in a room? How have you combated that? Can you provide us an example of like a, a situation that you kind of got into and you had to uh, work your way around it and it turned out well for you? Or maybe it didn't turn out well and you learned a lesson from it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's so many I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> exactly. On both sides. <laughs> yeah. Um, ego. Well, you know, I, I love what you said about emotional intelligence, right? Because that's totally key. Emotional, intelligent people win. And, and what do I mean by that? You know, in the in the cybersecurity world, my experience has been there's hyper intelligence, a lot of really super intelligent people, which I'm naturally attracted to. And these folks, they they know their stuff and they're and they're also very convinced that, that that what they know is the way, right? I mean, let's not talk about the Mandalorian and Star Wars, but this is the way. I mean, Perfect timing way, for May 4th was yesterday. Time, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> just a day later. And, you know, now we're on Cinco de Mayo, so I got to come up with something like that. Um, but yeah, so uh, they typically have their own process for how they manage these relationships. Yes, on one hand, they're, they're very intelligent. On the other hand, they're also, they've been trained to be very protective, very quiet, very patient, very careful about what they say. So sometimes what I found, actually a lot of the time with the cybersecurity executives, executives is they don't say enough or they say too much because it's like they've been taught not to say a lot, but when they're asked these questions, sometimes 
they just they really want to get it out so they say too much or sometimes they're they've been taught you know don't say a lot say very little and kind of be a little mysterious and let's let's you know because we can't say too much because we put ourselves at risk but they don't say enough to attract folks into you know their their realm and so the way that i've worked with executives on this if i've gotten to know them really well in advance and and this is part of a media training exercise it's written and it's audible where i'm sitting down with them and we're running through these kinds of questions that a journalist might ask and one question uh, you know that was a very big deal uh, that that is happening that had happened and the journalist asked some really tough questions and the ceo looked at me like you know how do i answer this and it's like real time here's a note you know real time here's a suggestion like you know sliding a piece of paper across the table you know and, or or sending a text right or sending a, a slack message you know now we're all at home but that those are those are different strategies that pr people entail to make sure that you know if if you know you want to pull something out of the executive while they're talking well here's a suggestion you can't tell them what to say and also in the moment Sometimes they're very, they, they kind of get into, everyone does, you get into a mode, like if you've ever played tennis, you're just in that mode, you know, and there's, I'm sure there's a word for it. And I know when I used to run, you know, you get that high when you're running and there's nothing else around the world, but that run. And if somebody says something to you or wants you to do something, you know, they have to be pretty far ahead of you to signal you to take a different course. And so I try to be, you know, try to think about, okay, what's coming up and can we guide this person, you know, in a new direction, a different direction or add something to the conversation that they might not have said. Yeah, that's all I keep while you're talking, I'm hearing a lot of like trust and influence. Those are big skills that you need to have to be successful in this space, but you can't have influence without having trust. Do you find that building trust in this space is a lot easier when you're recommended by maybe another PR agency or recommended by somebody in the organization? So you have those warm introductions prior to maybe cold calling a company to be their PR person? What have you found that's best? Because that's, it sounds like that's something that's going to be super critical. Yeah, it's, it's a hundred percent, Jax, hundred percent. It's, I mean, I, I just find it so fascinating that this is what I think one of the few businesses where a cold call just doesn't do it. I mean, if somebody called me up and said, Hey, you know, I've got all the experience and I can be the best PR person. I would definitely have a long conversation with them. I would want to get to know them quite well. I'd want to talk to people who know them. I would want to talk to people who are pretty close to me and close to them to see if they would be a good fit. And I'd want to make sure that, you know, our values really line up because, you know, I, I personally, if I was on the other side, I would want someone who was very kind, very humble, uh, very, very patient, uh, you know, maybe not so, detailed on exactly what it is I do in my company, but someone that has had experience in my company understands enough to be dangerous. Um, or, and, and also is it very, uh, you know, future forward thinking somebody that can say, okay, so, you know, I've been reading this industry analyst report, or I know this reporter writes about this, or I saw this, or I know this person is going to cover this as we say in PR. And, you know, maybe this is a story that we could pitch, or maybe this is something that we could, work on together to pitch or have you thought about doing a press release about this? And it's, it's that kind of really close personal relationship. You know, I call it like a, a marriage really it's you really have to really know someone inside and out backwards and forwards to really have success on both sides. So how do you get leadership then with your, with what you're doing and you're coming in, let's talk it, let's take this perspective from a new organization somewhere that you have just started. Maybe you've had one successful PR, but not a lot. So you haven't been there for over a year or two and they're still kind of filling you out. How do you get leadership to buy into your PR strategy? And then on top of it, because you can you can lay out the most amazing PR strategy, but if leadership isn't on board and they don't leverage their influence to make the impact of the organization, then it's gonna it's gonna fall dead, and you're not gonna be successful, even if it is the most amazing PR um, strategy that you have presented. So, what? How do you get them on board? Yeah, absolutely, great question. You know, if you ever if you ever hired a caterer, you don't just say, you know, I want chicken. Right. You, you say, OK, so what do you make? 
and they say, well, you know, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. And you say, oh, these are all wonderful, you know, but I like this one. I'm going to go with this one. And that's really the approach that I have uh, with our clients. I, I do not believe that there is one way and that's the highway. I believe that there are a lot of really smart strategies. I also think that the clients know more than any PR person ever will. And so uh, when it comes to outsource PR p- p- people, if the PR person's inside and they're, they, they're really connected to the, the company and it's their company, sometimes that skews toward the PR person, but still that PR person is not the CEO or the CTO. They're not actually in those kinds of weeds. And so, and they probably haven't had the experience of being a CISO, for example, you know, and and sometimes we work with people that have been like two, three times CISOs, they know their stuff. And Mm -hmm. so I'm not coming to them saying, you know, you should do this. You know, if you really want to be in featured, featured in this publication or be on this TV show or be in this podcast or be featured on this blog post, you have to do this. I say to them, well, you know, looking at where your company has been, looking at, communications that you have exercised looking at your competition then here's here's a few different approaches that we could take in this area and i tend to push it i tend to say well it'd be great if we had this kind of announcement because i know that's going to get media right and they push back and they say well you know we really can't do that or we we'd like to do that but like this or we don't really think that these are the points that we want to cover these are the points or or, yes sure we want to do that that's definitely the way we want to go and so, and then we kind of get into the words, word scramble a little bit about what words they want to use. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, you know, sometimes they want to use different words. Sometimes they're building out a category. They want to use those, those words. And so it's, it's more of that kind of relationship where, you know, it's not one and done. It is definitely a, okay, Hey, you know, you see what all the food we have, mm-hmm. you know, what do you want to choose from the menu to serve your guests? Mm. That is so, yeah. And it, it goes back to building trust and having that influence And Kimberly, Kimberly said it. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, her saying that actually yeah, reminded me when, right. I, when I used to do business in Asia, they're the way that they do business is very different with how we do business in the Western culture. Yes, we're all is. about like quick and fast. Where yep. working in Asia, it takes years sometimes to do a business yep. deal because they are all about relationship and building that relationship and taking that time to get to know one another. Uh, and it, it sounds like if you want to be in PR, then you need to be all about people. You need to place people first and you need to have really yep. good interpersonal skills. Yeah, you do. You do a hundred percent. You know what? And one thing that I, you know, I, I just preach to, to everybody, you know, clients, <laughs> Jax is, you know, when you pitch news, that, yeah. you know, don't, don't just pitch news. Isn't that funny? Like, what, 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 what does that mean? You know, somebody sends, says, I have a product launch and you know, I want to get press because I want to raise my share of voice. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, thank you. you can do that. You know, you know, a bunch of people are going to the RSA conference in June. You know, a bunch of folks are going to be writing about a certain topic. Okay. And you know, you can pitch them on that topic because you're announcing something and you know, you might get press, but that's not where it should start and end. Mm. The best, the best advice is and you know talking about you know there's one way you know, there's no one way no highway but yes the, on this highway it is so important if you're going to establish a relationship with someone like Mike Fizzer right mm-hmm. who writes for various publications you know get to know him you don't just spam him send him something that's relative to what he writes about really can right yeah. really connect with him really understand him like don't just read his last article read his last three to five articles, even use language he's been using in his articles and then follow up with him. Not because you've got something else to sell him about your company. Let him know that Gartner just came out with something that he may not have seen that relates to what he's written. Send him something that your client or your company said in, in a meeting that you're like, Oh my gosh, Mike would love to know about that. It's not confidential. It's not proprietary. I got the approval of my executive to share this with Mike. And Hey, I'm going to tell him that my client said this, and this is something. And Mike might say, you know what? I hadn't thought of that. I'm not going to write about it. I'm not going to quote your client, but I appreciate that background. Or he's going to say, you know what? I would love to write about that in blah, 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 because it's, it's specific to what he's writing about. But the point is, is to your point, it's relationships are really important. And from day one, 
like Kimberly was saying, you know, it takes a long time to manage those relationships. Start managing those relationships as soon as you can and, and build that database of good managed relationships because it won't only just help your client or your company, it'll help your career. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. I was like, I actually was taking notes because I'm like, that's this is that was gems right there. Such great uh, data because we live in a digital space and we don't get you and I have never met. We may never meet. You never know. There's people that I am dear friends with that I have still not met and I've known for almost yeah. three years now. Uh, so developing relationships in a digital space is going to be different. And some things I want to highlight that you just said that I want to dive a little deeper into is about how to develop a relationship without spamming or stalking somebody. And some things that I've done that work, and I'll get and want your insights on this, is what I will do is instead of like, let's use LinkedIn for an example, instead of connecting mm -hmm. with somebody, what I will do is I will follow and then there's this little bell icon at the top and I will click that. So I know whenever they post, I can like and I can make a comment that ha that's actually provides some value to the post that they've shared. And then I will do that for about a month. It depends on if I want to talk to them right away, I, but I'll spend at least a couple of weeks, you know, engaging in their content. And then I might reach out to them at that time and maybe share an article with them or something. That's just one thing that I've done when I've really wanted to connect with somebody because they know, not when you just like their page, but they know as soon as they make a post, if you're one of the first two or three people that make a comment, they're going to see that. And if you do it on a regular basis, and it's not just great article, but it actually has some substance behind it, they notice that and they take note. And then they're like, wow, this person actually has like some stuff to say. I'd really like to engage in them. What are your thoughts around that? Have you noticed that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's not. I mean, I just gave you the thumbs up, but, you know, we're talking. So that's cool. You can't just give somebody the thumbs up or the yeah. love or the support or whatever the emojis they have on LinkedIn yeah. these days. You know, you're right. You really have to. Um, start to establish i call it like establishing and then maintaining a relationship you really have to start establishing a relationship and you can do it on the back channel right on on linkedin they call that the back channel on clubhouse but you can do it on the back channel on linkedin also by reaching out to them through the messaging platform or you know you can get their email and, and do it on the media side it's a little bit different i think because a lot of it has to do with timing right a lot of it has to do with, well, is this something that they're interested in, you know, keeping for background or keeping, you know, in their back pocket because they want to write about it and quote you or your company very soon. Um, or, or it, you know, it's, 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 it's on background or it's something that, you know, they, they don't want to do anything about because the timing isn't good and, and they're not interested, but they're not saying anything either. And you're continually reaching out to them. And I've noticed that some PR people, I'm not going to say all, some people are appeal get very aggressive. I, I like to use yeah. the word assertive when people do PR because it's good to be assertive, but it's not good to be good being aggressive. And I'll tell you why real quick. It's because when a person is assertive, oh my gosh, look, I know where the gold is, you know, and I'm going to go mine the gold. And so to mine the gold, you need to bring the right tools to mine the gold. You need to know where it is. You need to be very gentle, very careful with it. And it's a relationship you have with the environment, right? You don't want to disrupt the environment, right? It's the same thing in this, in this relationship. You want to be very gentle and very forthcoming and very honest and very transparent with the journalist. You don't want to just jump into their environment and say, hey, I saw you were writing about this. I've got a great company for you to speak to. You should speak to them. You should speak to them right now. I, you know, what's your schedule look like next week? No, no, it, it is more of like, to your point, Jax, it's more of a, okay, so, hey, I saw, you know, Eric, you're writing about this or Jane or John. And I, I just wanted to share that, you know, I really enjoyed what you wrote because, you know, the company I'm representing or I work for wrote something similar on their blog recently, although they had a different point of view. If you have a chance to check it out, you know, I'd love to take, have you take a look at it. They don't respond. It's like, well, I just want to follow up. You know, I wasn't sure if you had a chance or an interest to check it out. But, but you see where I'm going with this? It's more of a, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about them. It's about what you're giving them. It's about you being of service to them because ultimately you're helping them and you're helping their reader, which is going to help your client and their end customer. It's not what about you got today. 
It's not about fulfilling your obligation and the money that you're making. It's not about any of that. You got to figure it about yourself. Mm -hmm. You got to think about them. Yeah. Oh my God. It's all about them. See, we're going back to, to the client, the customer critical. Yep. Um, okay. Critical. So we, we had a question pop up a little bit back from Gerald that I think is great. So Gerald Osher is the, the founder and content creator for Simply Cyber, a, a, a global cybersecurity brand. And so he's asking for himself, when do you know you need a PR person? Is it reactive or proactive? So is there really a point in your journey where like now is the time or is there when, yeah, when is that shift? That's a great question. Yeah, that is a really good shift. I think there's a very famous Irish poet whose name's on, name I'm blanking on who said, you know, what bad PR, you know, what is it? I'm not, I'm misquoting him, but basically, you know, there's no bad PR and, you know, your until your obituary comes out. But in any event, <laughs> oh my God, I've never heard that one. That is awesome. <laughs> I wish I had it on the top. You know, it's in the, it's in the presentation somewhere. Uh, yeah. So, you know, how do you, how do you know when you need a PR person? That, that is a really, really good question because I, um, a lot of the folks that we work with only think they need a PR person when they have an announcement to make, mm -hmm. right? When they have something to launch, when they want to get funding, when they got funding, and you know now there's something to announce. Now, my argument is, well, you when you when you realize you have a point of differentiation, right? When you realize, oh, you know. I can change the market. I am changing the market. I have customers. I've got case studies. I've got logos that can speak. Oh, it's time for PR. Absolutely. Because then you can basically say, well, the old way was fine. But the reason that I developed this company, and I think the reason anyone develops any company, is because there's a new way of doing something. They're just not going to reinvent the wheel. They're going to create a new kind of wheel. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I think that aha moment goes off at least for the executives that say, wow, we had a client that was when I, when I got first introduced to them and they had this new product announcement and, and the PR person articulated to me, I said, Oh my gosh, they need a lot of PR. This is incredible. Like, how do you, how do you even do that? Right. An artificial intelligence company. And so, and that, that was a very exciting moment for me. And they didn't have logos to speak to mm. that could speak. You know, and so there's also an opportunity like, you know, in publications like TechCrunch that speak to the future yeah. of what's happening. They look at more of the technology and not at, well, you have to have a customer to speak today. You know, they might they might want more, you know, an exclusive or something, a little for, first look. But so anyways, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but there's really no I guess what I'm saying is there's really no one way or the highway either on this. But I always think that if you've got a differentiation and you can articulate that with customers behind you that can speak, oh boy, you're mm. ready for PR. Oh my gosh, that's a great answer. Thank you, David. And a follow-up statement that I made me laugh, he, uh, Gerald said, it's okay, David, businesses only need cyber people <laughs> after they've been hacked. So I never even really no. thought about that until, yep, you started sharing your side of the story, but it's so true. It's, very, it's a very reactionary space, which that leads me into my next question, that I want to talk about, which is being able to leverage effective communication strategy to basically to use it to get ahead of an incident or maybe even mitigate an incident before it even happens. How have you been able to do that with PR? I can imagine there's like using it as basically a control measure, a cybersecurity control measure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've done I've done crisis communication when we've had to do crisis communication, mm. right? Um, and, and unfortunately, in a lot of companies' examples, they at least, well, it depends upon the company. Usually bigger companies have crisis communications plans just set, right? They have crisis communications people on staff, or they have people that have crisis communications experience that have gone through something similar. When it comes to a breach, unfortunately, my experience is a lot of companies don't have or haven't had that. I do think that's changed, especially you know, in the most recent years, I do think a lot of companies do have uh, those plans in place. Like I was talking about earlier incidents and responses. I do hope, you know, that they're not just turning on the PR engine because they've been hacked. Uh, that that really would not be in anyone's business interest, especially their end customers. So I think the the more advanced 
companies and even the vendors are, are now even preparing their customers for if there is an incident, you know, here's an approach that we've taken with our customers in how to approach this, how to speak to the media. And I think that's, that's such a valuable tool across the board. Mm-hmm. And that is its own business, by the way, Jax. You know, a lot of folks really focus specifically just on crisis communications. We don't. We're more on the side of the, you know, you, you really want to get to your exit faster. You know, mm-hmm. what can we do to help you get there? How can we help you really point out differenti- differentiation? What can we use to you know, help communicate that clearly to the audience? We're not coming in and saying, oh my gosh, something horrible happened and we help, need to help mitigate this. Yeah, so let's talk about that, getting to the exit quicker, because that is a different type of PR and media strategy. And I know I worked at a startup tech firm for a little while. They were mm-hmm. about uh, two and a half years. They were in, I think they were in seed round B or C, so still fairly young, but they were already acquisition in, in eyesight. And with that came a lot of media and a lot of press. And uh, they were, they had hired a third party person, probably a person like yourself, that was pushing them in front of different news stations. They were smaller ones like Yahoo, a couple out of Canada, not the really big names. And I'm curious how, when you're working with these organizations that are doing these exit strategies and are like, put me in front of all the media, let me tell them how amazing my tooling is. How, how do you get an organization to basically have that balance of promoting their business and what they can provide versus just all about their tooling or being that subject matter expert, that bobblehead, because you want to be, you want to be a little bit of each of those for those organizations to want to call you back and be like, I want to talk to David because he's a cybersecurity expert and he owns this company instead of the other way around. So yeah, if you could talk a little bit about how do you do that with an org? Yeah, it really depends on the org. I mean, I hate to say it like that, but it's so all true, depends. right? <laughs> of, of course, all of it. Well, I mean, I'll give you one example, right? So it just just to be fair and, and for and for the people watching and listening, it's one of our co- customers came to us and they, you know, if you don't have an exit strategy planned when you start, that's a big no-no. You got to start with a stop in mind because there's all different kinds of exits and you don't want to be caught with your tail behind. And so they knew they were going to be acquired at point. That was their strategy. And the CMO, we all sat down and he said, you know, what do you think about this PR strategy? And we're like, yeah, you know, that's really not going to cut it. You know, there's really no news in that. However, there's one heck of a social media marketing program. If you do that, you know, if you go to RSA and you pull off that big publicity stunt and we put that all over social media, you will get attention. You will get attention on LinkedIn. As a matter of fact, maybe we should spend some money on LinkedIn, maybe on Twitter to drive people to that event. And, and to get them there and to get them engaged. And maybe there should be some sort of sign up. And, and so it was that, that kind of creativity outside of your traditional public relations that really helped drive eyeballs to that company, which later very quickly got it acquired. And so that's, that's kind of one really quick magic bullet. And then in, in, in another example, a client came to us and they said, well, you know, we ha- we're at the end of our cycle as far as developing a solution. And we know there's companies that don't have what we have. We just know there's companies that could acquire us. And so we want to be in front of this company. We want to be in front of that company. And so we sat down and we helped them redefine their messaging, which helped, right, take that differentiation and make it specific to those target audiences instead of the audiences they were targeting prior. And all of a sudden, by redefining their messaging, we took that messaging, used that in the PR, and then that helped get in front of one company and in front of the other company in literally their backyards. And the companies woke up and they started fighting with each other about who would acquire that company. Mm. And one of those companies acquired that customer. Boom. That was a huge win within four months. And so that was a definite acceleration. Yeah. Of of how PR can help move that ball forward very quickly. Okay. So there has to be a little bit of luck involved in this because as you're talking, I was taking some notes over here and something I was thinking about is um, let's use, for example, solar winds before solar winds. If you were working with an organization that said, for example, they had a supply chain risk management tooling that helped automated security operations, the likelihood of getting acquired maybe before solar winds with such a type of tooling maybe would have been a little bit harder but after solar winds, organizations are like, oh my gosh, I need a tooling. Even right now, uh, supply chain risk is like top of discussion, especially within the 
the public yeah. sector. So do you think that there's a little bit of luck and like a sweet spot when you're working with some of these organizations on their exit strategy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is the, you're just making my blood pressure go up because <laughs> <laughs> what, what, the, one of the best things an executive ever said to me after we all found out about his acquisition is he pulled me aside and he very quietly said, it's not just about the PR. The PR didn't do this for us. Everyone thinks it did. It's not. And I said to myself, of course not. It is about the people. Mm. It's all about the people. It's like any good basketball team, any good baseball team, any good football team, any business team. When you get the right people together at the right time with the right solution in that order, you know, going back to the catering example, it's going to be the best food at the best party ever. Really? That's what it comes down to. It's like, and, and you want to hire people that are smarter than you are. When you are pulling together your marketing, your PR team, you really want to get people that are going to challenge you. You really want to get people on board that are going to say, have you looked at it this way? Have you looked at it that way? They may not be right. They may give you 10 ideas and one may be good. None may be good. But the point is, is that it's not just about the PR. It's not just about one person. It's about how you collaborate within that, that relationship. Now, however, I will say that how the company is positioned and how it's communicated is a huge deal. But again, that's not done in a vacuum. You know, the reason that the company I just talked about did so well to that point and, and was acquired so quickly was because the CEO, the CTO, the engineers, the, the VP of marketing, oh, when, when I first sat down with this team, I said, oh my gosh, you have no idea what you have here. And, I, and they're like, no, we do. Is and I said, okay, team? so it's a dream team. Exactly. And so, you know, wow. and what was the challenge, Jax? The challenge is, well, how can we all communicate this dream to other people to help them kind of buy into the dream to then buy the company? Hmm. And we, you know, wow. we went back and forth with the messaging. We went back and forth with the PR. We went back and forth with, well, you know, you want to be in this publication. You want to be in that publication. You know, are you targeting this company? Are you targeting that company? And then finally, we distilled it down and realized, aha, here is the, here's the magic. Mm. So it does sound like, okay, actually, no, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a different question. It, because my experience working in the startup was not, we, we did not, we were not connected like that. So there was a lot of miscommunication and fragmentation, siloed working environments, even for a small company. Do you find that that is typically the number one cause for an organization not to be acquired? Or is there something else that you see if you could put your finger on like one thing that you're like, Usually organizations that have this challenge is tells me that they're it's probably they're either not going to get acquired or it's going to take a lot longer. Yeah, and we'll probably see this in the chat. Everybody say this at the same time. No product market fit. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. It's like everybody chat that ugly. up. <laughs> now you're like, your baby's ugly. It's not going to work. No. Yeah. The cybersecurity company comes to me and says, we have a dashboard for everybody. Everybody's yeah. going to love this dashboard because it's going to show everybody everything about, you know, the, their risk profile. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, you know, no, I see comments popping in. No, it, it's not. Really it's, dying yeah, over here. Yeah, yeah. Right. Kimberly, it, it is. It is. I mean, I'm just going to break out in tears right now. Thanks, Jax. Yeah. Yeah. Wash hands. Watch that. Watch that. Yeah. It, it is. Yeah, yeah. It is not. It is not. It is yeah. not. You, you know, if, if there's no product market fit. Yeah, that that is unfortunately the biggest challenge. And then and then what I see is the executives, they throw more money at it. Yeah. And they hire more people and they try and change the website. Yeah. And they right. Yeah. And, and they change the marketing slicks. Yeah. And and then the narrative hasn't changed. Right. And, mm -hmm. and because like there and when I when I mean narrative, I, I'm not talking about the story. I'm not talking about a press release. I'm talking about like. You know, if, if there's a wonderful book named um, The Narrative Playbook by Tobin Trevartan and other authors, everybody has to get this book. I'm talking about like Oprah, right? What's, what's Oprah known for? You can help yourself. Everything that she does, whether she's speaking, or the magazine, it used to be a magazine, it's no longer my old magazine, but you know, even Dr. Oz, anyone who's talking on behalf of, in Oprah's network is talking about, you can help yourself. 
And so this this is what I see with you know the challenge in the cybersecurity world, as was mentioned earlier in the comments, is that you know we're also focused on the hack. We're also focused on you know what's the latest what's the latest breach. What's the latest company that's you know lost data or what? Who, what's the ransom now? When we should be talking about okay, if the company had some sort of event, please tell me that that company has been in their whole narrative talking about how they're really focused on trust. They're really focused on focusing on the customer and the customer's data, focusing on privacy, focusing on we really are helping you help yourself. Whatever that narrative is for that company, somewhere in that narrative, it is there is something that they've communicated that shows that we're not just coming at this in the 11th hour and saying, oh my gosh, now we were breached. We got to communicate to all the stakeholders. We got to make this all come 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 back to us not losing any money or any customers or any financing or any blah. No, 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 no. It is about maintaining the conversation that you've been having and just making sure that everyone's reminded that you're on board, you're going to take care of this and that you're not going to let anyone down. Mm. God, wow. That's awesome. I almost feel like that should be final thoughts, but we're getting to the end. And David, I want to provide you an opportunity to provide some final thoughts before I take you off the stage and put you back in the green room for a little while to talk about the future episode. So I'll let you take it away. All right. You know, I, I'd love to do a recap, re recap, but we talked about so much <laughs> stuff. <Yeah, laughs> really it's a great interview. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. I'm really grateful for your time. I just want to say that before I'm put in the back room. So thank you for that. It's been great to get to know you and, and you're so talented. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just, I want to go back to relationships, right? You know, and you, and you brought this up and we, and we talked about this and, you know, it does come back to trust. It does come back to relationships because I just, you know, I've been doing this for so many years. I just, I love it when, you know, the reporters get back and say, Hey, what's up, David, you know? Or, you know, they, they're like, oh, great to hear from you again. Because, you know, I feel like, wow, you know, I've really had clients that have built their trust. I've really been articulating their, the client messages in a nice, open way where these people, the, the journalists and the editors, have been respected. And that's so incredibly important. That cannot be ignored. If that is the number one thing that everyone takes away from this, please treat people kindly. Please treat them with respect. Please treat people like you would like to be treated yourself. That is the number one gift that you can give anybody else. Thank you. Oh, my God. I love that. The golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated. Absolutely. Um, well, we are hopping off. I know Navi just dropped a question in there, but... Um, Navi, I will message you directly on that. So David, thank you again. I'm gonna go ahead and take you off stage and talk about next week's thank show. Thank you, Jax. All right, thank you so much. Bye. Wow, guys, that was awesome. Major deep dive. Um, Amy, I saw you pop in. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody. Simon, you're probably not in here anymore, but I also saw you pop in briefly. Eula, great to have you. Some new guests, I love it, warms my heart. Navi, I saw you pop in. I'll reach out to you. You can actually, if you reach out to me on LinkedIn, I can help answer that question if you would like. Super easy to find me, Jax S. All right, so let's talk about next week because we've got Simply Cyber starting in about three minutes. So we're going to make this fast because I know I'm going to be heading over there and I hope to see you all over there too. Next week, I am so excited. I have two people coming on the show that I have been waiting to get on the show for a while. Stefan and Kimberly, we're going to be talking about LinkedIn branding, specifically all about LinkedIn. We're going to talk about how the algorithms work and some tips and tricks on how to better leverage LinkedIn uh, to build your brand. And these two individuals have built phenomenal brands. Kimberly is the co-founder of Cybersecurity Central. If you don't know about it, definitely go check it out. I don't know why I'm pointing over there, probably because my other screen has LinkedIn over here. So Go to LinkedIn, check it out, or go out the window. You don't know where I'm pointing. So definitely tune in for next week for that. And then the next week following that, we have the Female Voice of Innovation and Technology. Third Thursdays of every month, we highlight one woman that is doing large and impactful things within innovation and technology. 
And Melissa Arscog is 40 under 40. She has worked in the cybersecurity space for the majority of her life, started out as an engineer. We're going to talk to her about why she turned down the award of 30 under 30 when she was first awarded it due to imposter syndrome. So you're definitely wanting to tune in for that. All right, guys, as always, thank you so much. You guys are the reason that I do this. All of you, I'm so thrilled to have you. And I love when I have new guests. For anybody that's new, that's maybe at the tail end of this, every Thursday I go live from 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. I do one-on-ones, I have firesides, and I do panel discussions. So come back next week, join us, join the community. We would love to have you. All right, I'm signing out. Oh, go over to Simply Cyber and make sure to put hashtag Outpost Gray, and I'll be over there shortly after I wrap up. Bye.